Turn with me to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, where we're going to be studying not verses 1 to 17, but verses 1 to 13. I think it will be fairly true and reasonably accurate to say that last Sunday evening we dealt with Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, in the sense that we swept right through the chapter, <coughs> outlining the six, def the six clear sections and indicating something of a heading for each section. And the section, chapter 8, verses 1 to 13, is entitled, Life in or Life by the Holy Spirit. Now, Romans chapter 8 is in every sense a great chapter. It is encouraging, it is exciting, it is reassuring, and it is full of practical instruction with regard to living the Christian life. Of course, it is not an easy chapter. It is a very, very closely reasoned chapter. It begins, there is therefore now no condemnation on the basis of the salvation that has been expounded in chapters 1 to 7. On that basis, there is therefore now no condemnation for, for those who are in Christ Jesus. The next word is for which could easily read, because. And going down through the chapter, and I've underlined them in my Bible, in verse 2 we have the word for, we have it in verse 3, verse 5, verse 6, 7, 13, 14, and 15, indicating that the whole sequence of the chapter, all the teaching, is reasoned out, phrase by phrase, lesson by lesson, right through the whole of the chapter. And we remind ourselves that right from the beginning of Paul's letter to the Romans, from chapter 1, verse 16, the theme is the gospel. The gospel which is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God unto salvation in the fullest sense that it can be understood, expressed perhaps best of all in the verse Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25, he is able to save to the uttermost, to the uttermost of time, the uttermost of need. He is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to him through Jesus Christ. And some of you will recall, because you've been following these studies right the way through, that having expressed his, his pride in and his rejoicing in the gospel, Paul says in chapter 1, verse 17, In the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, He who through faith is righteous shall live. The sinner who through faith in Jesus Christ finds salvation and is set right with God, that believing sinner shall live. What kind of life will that justified sinner live? And Paul takes the whole of Romans chapter 8 to describe the life of the justified sinner. And we're only looking at the first section of that tonight in verses 1 to 13. The heading in the Revised Standard Version is Life in the Spirit. We could read it Life by the Spirit. Living the Christian life by the power of the Holy Spirit who has been given to every believer. That was the point of drawing your attention to the line of that hymn. Think what spirit dwells in you. You say, well, preacher, I, I, I'm quite sure I am a Christian. All right, I'm not arguing the point with you. I'll take your word for it. If whether God takes your word for it or not is a, maybe a different thing. You are a Christian. 
All right. Think what spirit dwells within you. And that's the theme that runs right through these 13 verses. It begins, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who, because they have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation, are in Christ or united to Christ in all the benefits and in all the power of his death and resurrection. All that he did and all that he acquired and all that he won is ours. We don't deserve it, of course. But we're not talking about deserving. We're talking about gospel. There is no condemnation. Because the whole situation is clear between the believing sinner and God and between God and the believing sinner. Justified by faith accepted as righteous in God's sight because we have put our trust in Jesus Christ. To use the phrase from Wesley's great hymn that we sang last Sunday evening, clothed in righteousness divine. Justified by faith, we are accepted by God, we are reconciled to God, we are forgiven by God, the burden of sin and guilt has been lifted. The barriers of sin and guilt have gone. The broken relationship with God has been restored. And we have been set free to live. And because we are in Christ, there is no condemnation of any kind. For, verse 2, because... The law or the principle of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law or the principle of sin and death. The spirit of life. The spirit of life is the Holy Spirit. Think what spirit dwells within you. The spirit of life has set me free. But notice again, we've got the words, in Christ Jesus. And this is very important whenever we begin to speak about the person and the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no separate, no different gospel of the Holy Spirit. The gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we mustn't ever think in any sense at all that we advance from Christ to the Holy Spirit. It is by the power, the inspiration, and the enablement of the Holy Spirit who has been given to us that we lay hold on and prove in practice all that we have in Christ Jesus. It's all given to us, and by all I mean salvation. And salvation has inbuilt in the very word life. It's given to us in Christ, and the Holy Spirit is given to us to lay hold upon it and to prove it. When Paul says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death, he's saying, now you've got to recognize that since you put your trust in Jesus Christ, a new principle operates in your life in respect of you in this world. We are no longer held under the principle and the power of sin and death. I have a number of times in the course of expounding Romans uh, referred you to Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 2 and especially there verses 1 and 2. 
You, Paul says to the believers in Ephesus, you God made alive when you were dead through trespasses and sins. In which condition you are, or under which principle of spiritual deadness and impotence, in which condition you once walked, that is, you once lived your life following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among these we all once lived in the passions or the desires or the inclinations of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind, and so we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That was the principle of life under which we lived before we became Christians. I've said it before, I say it again. There are people who say, Oh, I don't want to be a Christian. I want to be free to live my life the way I want to. There's no such thing as freedom apart from being in Christ Jesus. We, we are hemmed in, we are controlled by, we are driven by, we are dominated by all sorts of things. The principle of sin and death. But now a new principle operates because of the presence and the power of the life-giving Spirit of God. We live under a new principle altogether. Now it's difficult to find illustrations to illustrate this kind of thing, but think for example of your car, whether it's a new car or an old banger. If the battery is flat, there's no life in the battery. Nothing works. The engine won't turn, the windscreen wipers won't move, the lights won't shine. There's nothing. There is deadness. But if life is put back into the battery, then the full range of possibilities begin to operate. That's what it's like. You are a sinner, dead in trespasses and sins. But now, there is new life by the Holy Spirit. Many years ago, I used a different kind of illustration, the kind that rather gives away something of my age. Thinking, for example, of the little village school. And in these days, it was important at school you had to learn to write properly. They didn't approve of scrawly handwriting. So either up on the blackboard or at the top of the page in your exercise book, there would be a line of, oh, beautiful writing. And you had to do it. And many a time I was right at the foot of the page and I still hadn't got anywhere near a copy of that beautiful writing. And even when the teacher came and put her hand on my hand, holding the pen or the pencil, to help me to get the curve of the letters properly, there was in my hand and arm something of a stiffness and something of a perversity, and the poor teacher began to lose heart. What I really needed was the spirit of the teacher, not just her hand upon me, I needed the spirit of the teacher within me. And if I had the spirit of the teacher within me, then my hand would operate the way that the teacher's hand would operate. And this is what we're speaking about here. The very spirit of God. The spirit of Jesus Christ within us to enable us to operate in a Christ-like way. The law or the principle of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free. Now freedom is not a negative thing. There are lots of people who don't know what to do with their freedom. I, I remember a minister saying to me once, I, I don't know what to do when I go on holiday. I felt awfully sorry for him. Freedom is not negative. And as I've been trying to co convey with these illustrations I've used, along with the freedom, there is power. 
And along with the freedom and the power, there is desire. What did we sing in that hymn number 180? And every virtue we possess, and every victory won, and every thought of holiness are his alone. When there stirs within you that, that desire, sometimes it's a longing, a longing to be good, a longing to be able to be the kind of person and to live the kind of life that really pleases God. That's the work of the Spirit of God within your heart. And when these, when these stirrings and longings begin to operate, the message that we need is, think what spirit dwells within you. I recognize that as Christians we can be very stupid sometimes, and very perverse, and very stubborn, and we go wrong and we make a mess of things, and we blunder again and again and again and again. But then, you see, we don't give up. Think what spirit dwells within you, in that Holy Spirit. No, no, you can't. No, no, says the Holy Spirit. We are not giving up. And this is what Paul is speaking about here. And he goes on in verse 3 with another, for or because. You know, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death because God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he that is God condemned sin in the flesh in order that, but we better take it slowly. God has done what the law couldn't do. Now the law, whether the law of the land or God's law, law can point to what should be. Law can prescribe, law can prohibit, law can demand. But because human nature is perverse, as well as weak. Law cannot enable. You know, how, how often in the course of a week or in the course of your, a, a year in your Christian life do you say, oh, I, I should do this or that or the other. Very often you never get around to doing it. How often do you say, oh, I, I shouldn't have done that. But you did it, and you'll do it again, and you'll do it again. The flesh, human nature, is both weak and perverse. And what the law could not do, God did. And God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now this is an astonishing statement. God sent his own son to be one of us. Now again I say, we've got to be careful. Jesus was a real man. His human life was not a pretense. He was a real human being as you are and as I am and therefore we are never entitled to say oh it was easy for Jesus. The Westminster Confession that I was reading with regard to the person of Christ says in this connection that he took upon him man's nature with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin. 
I don't know that, that we need to take time uh, to, to look up references, but in Hebrews chapter 1, the very first chapter of Hebrews, it speaks of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God spoke through his Son, who is the exact likeness of God. And then in chapter 2 it says of this same Jesus, he was tempted in all points like as we are. Now this is what God did. He sent Jesus to be really like us. He didn't send Jesus to be like Adam in the Garden of Eden, in ideal circumstances, with everything going for him. The Garden of Eden was a great place to live. It really was. But God sent Jesus to be his son Jesus to be really like us, not like Adam in ideal circumstances, but he sent Jesus to be like us in the real world of evil, in the world of sin, in the world of ruthless criticism and rejection. He sent Jesus to be his son to be really like us and to face the powers of evil in the most unpropitious circumstances out in the desert for 40 days, six full weeks, in the blazing heat of the day and the freezing cold of the night, tempted in all points like as we are, face to face with the very person of the devil himself. As a man, not as God, but Jesus as a man just like us. Yet without sin. Ah, you see, that makes him different from us. Yes. But we need to remember that a knowledge of sin is not necessary in order to be truly human. Now think that one through. It is when we trifle with sin that we become less than human as God would define being human. And the truth of the matter is that apart from being in Christ, we are and we remain less than human. And God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin or for a sin offering alone. He condemned sin in the flesh, or in the flesh, as a man, he condemned sin. This is why Jesus came, to deal with sin as a power. And in a truly human life, he condemned sin. He passed judgment upon sin. He pronounced sin is not necessary for human life and for, for, and for human life to be lived to please God. One of the commentaries, very marvelous new commentary by Leon Morris on the Epistle to the Romans, uses the illustration of a building being condemned. And when the building is condemned, it is of no further use and demolition follows. It's condemned. Sin 
as a power has been condemned. In the court of a truly human life, sin as a power did its very best, but the verdict went against it. Sin was condemned. No longer needed, no longer having a place, a rightful place in human life. The other Sunday we sang the hymn number 125, one of the great Easter hymns that got a, a verse in it that says, O sin, thou art vanquished, thy long reign is o'er, though still thou dost vex us, we dread thee. No, we, we're not going to be cowed by sin. It's got no right in our lives at all. We have been emancipated from the rule or the dominion of sin. I suppose the illustration that most of the commentators would use would be a very familiar one from Paul's day, from the realm of slavery. And when a slave was redeemed and the price was paid by someone and the slave was set free, then he was emancipated. He was no longer a slave. He was free. He could walk tall. And you can imagine him walking down the street one day and he notices his former master crossing over to his side of the... Can you imagine this? Oh, it's him. And then he's saying, Ah, oh, but he has no right over me anymore. Now that's the situation with the rule and the dominion and the tormenting of sin. But look how it goes on in verse 4. God, in the flesh, that is in the human life of Jesus Christ, God condemned sin in order that. You see, God had a clear objective in mind. In order that <laughs> the just requirement of God's law might be fulfilled in people like you and me who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit this is god's purpose this was this was what the, the, the sure fulfillment that was his objective that righteousness and the righteous requirements of the law which only the man christ jesus has fulfilled might be fulfilled in us believers but people sometimes oh but oh but what if we don't walk according to this no no read it carefully in order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us believers and because we are believers the truth about us is by definition we do not walk, that is, we do not live our lives according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And this is what Paul goes on to expound, beginning in verse 5. Because those who live according to the flesh, that is, if the guiding principle of their lives is the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. See, you, you, you can always recognize a Christian by simply looking at the way they live their lives. The principles on which they li live their lives. The desires, the inclinations, the patterns of their lives. Verse 6, and there should in a sense be set into verse 6 the little word for, because to set the mind on the flesh, is death, but to set the mind, think in terms, set the mind, think of a mindset. You know how we say something, oh, these people, they're, they're always thinking about winning the lottery. We see that's their mindset. And that, that indicates, that directs the whole of their lifestyle. People say critically about other people, 
Oh, you're, you're always thinking about church and Bible. Well, if people say that about you, you should be pleased. That's your mind set. To set the mind, verse 6, on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind that is set on the flesh Oh, you say, Mr. Lube, I, I think I really am a, a worldly Christian. Well, the mind that is set in the flesh is hostile to God. You're at loggerheads with God. It does not submit to God, for indeed it cannot. And those who are in the flesh can not please God. Paul here is speaking about Christian believers and he describes them this is this is the definition of a Christian he describes them as those who do not live their lives according to the flesh that is they do not order their lives the pattern of their lives and the priorities of their lives from a worldly material pleasure self satisfying point of view because that kind of mindset sets the horizon of your life the limit of the horizon of your life upon self not on Christ not on God not on the things of God as priorities Didn't Jesus say on one occasion, seek first as an absolute priority, covering 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks in the year, and all the years that you're allowed to live. Seek first the kingdom of God and his oh but people say if, if, if I do that there's, there's so little time left that's not really true there's plenty time left and there's all the time left that is good for you to do these other things but if you get the balance out of order then you find you have a mindset that is fleshly or worldly and though you profess to be a Christian you begin to discover that God and Christ and the gospel are fitted in in a way that won't interfere with the things that you really want to do Those who are in the flesh can not please God. And to set the mind on the flesh, says verse 6, is death. It is negative. And increasingly negative. And as you grow older, you begin to be aware of how little you have that is really worth having. Setting the mind on the flesh rather than on Christ and of God and God and the things of God as priorities around which priorities and in submission to which priorities all the rest of life revolves I indicated earlier I say it again you can tell what a person's life set is really really is by what that person lives for and what that person is really enthusiastic for the mindset which focuses on the flesh that is on this life which is exceedingly temporary we all like to think that we'll get our three score years and ten and 
with all the good conditions that we've got nowadays, national health service and this and that and the other and medical help. Oh, well, lots of people now go well below beyond the 70s and the 80s. I may be. But not always by any means. Some don't reach 20. And quite a few never reach 30. It's why it's so important to handle our life properly. Because, you see, the life of, what's one of the hymns, is it one of Bonner's hymns, the life above is the ripe fruit of life below. You know the story of the man who got to heaven and always looking forward to his mansion in the sky, you know, that kind of thing. And he's being led along with, by an angel or by Peter. It's just a story. Past all, the, But he noticed that the houses were getting smaller and smaller. And eventually they arrived at a wee tumble-down shack. And he, it was indicated that this was his. And he was terrible. Oh, is, is that all? And the angel said, well... We did our best with the material that you sent. What will you be like in heaven? Come on now, think about it. Because the way you live your life just now is going to have an awful lot to do with that. The mindset which focuses on the flesh, this life, this world, is death. And it cuts you off from true life in Christ. And increasingly you find that your lifestyle is hostile to God because it is not allowing God to lead you on into the full development of his will for you. But the mindset that is set on allowing God to lead you by the Spirit to do His will, that is life and peace. And the statement in verse 8 is really very radical. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're in Christ, there will be evidences. If you're in the flesh, it will become plain that your real, your real motivation is worldly. And a worldly life cannot please God. But then Paul goes on in verses 9 to 13 to say, but you... You who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation, you Christian believers, you are not in the flesh. This, this is the truth about you. You are not in the flesh anymore. If you are a Christian believer, Paul has said it in verse 1, you are in Christ, not in the flesh. And here in verse 9 he begins to say, you are not in the flesh, you are in in the spirit that is in the realm on the level that is the realm the level the nature of your life is in the spirit yes yes you're still you're still here in this world that says Paul and your your complicated personalities and your inheritances from the past are still being worked at by God that takes us away back to verse 4 again God, God working to fulfill his righteousness in your personality and in your life. Yes, you're still in the flesh. You're still in this world. You're still being worked at by God. But these, these things of the past are no longer the dominant or the directing factors of your life. Nor are they the circumstances of your life. You are in Christ. Some people speak about feeling safe. 
where, for example, when they're in church. You know, sometimes on a Sunday evening, oh, I'm amongst God's people here in God's house and singing these hymns, and oh, oh, I feel safe. I think I feel safe here. But that's nothing like the safety that is ours in Christ. Is it in Paul's letter to the Colossians that he says, your life is hid with Christ in God. We used to say as safe as the Bank of England, but it's not a very good illustration nowadays. Your life is hid with Christ in God. You are in Christ. You are in the Spirit. The second half of verse 9 the Spirit of God dwells, and, and the word dwell is, is not a word that refers to a lodger. It refers to a permanent resident. He's here to stay. You are in Christ. You are in the Spirit. The Spirit of God is in you. Christ is in you. You notice... Paul is really doing what preachers are not supposed to do. He's repeating himself. Oh, he's using different words, but he's repeating himself. Because he's aware that people can be slow to grasp the truth. So using a whole lot of different phrases, he's trying to get home to us the truth of who we are and what we are and what we have because we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation. We are in Christ. We are in the Spirit. The Spirit is in us. Christ is in us. Is it Colossians chapter 1 verse 27? Christ in you. The hope of glory. The Spirit of God in you. His Spirit. That brings us to, to verse 11. God the Holy Spirit dwells in your heart and life in the whole of your personality and he dwells there as a permanent resident now when you when you get a new house what you start to do straight away is to settle in and if you've inherited various things that were in the, belonged to the former owner, uh, the part of the process of settling in is sorting things out. And you don't want that there, and you, it looks far better over there, and that's going into the other room, and that's not staying in my house at all, and it goes out to the bin. Now, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell as a permanent resident in our hearts, our lives, our personality. He immediately begins to settle in and to make himself comfortable and to rearrange the furniture of our life and personality to please God and to serve God's will and God's purpose. So the Holy Spirit working within us, rearranging, sorting out, and adjusting the balance of life and personality, he's at it all the time. He's a great worker is the Holy Spirit. And God the Father Almighty it says, as it were, oh, forgive the language, I'm trying to I'm trying to preach it me to encourage me as well as to encourage you. As the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives gets on with these words, the Father in heaven, oh, yeah, oh that, that's coming along nicely. But that other room, that other bit, that, that's not right. That needs changed. And the Holy Spirit gets on working the change. And sometimes, because we are perverse, Oh, oh, I want that in my life. And the Holy Spirit says, well, I don't. But I want it in my life. And the Holy Spirit says, well, I don't. And God doesn't. Well, you can argue the point as long as you like. But if you argue too long, 
it may be an indication that God the Holy Spirit is not there at all. It may be an indication that after all you are not really a Christian. Paul says in verse 10, If Christ is in you, though your bodies are dead because of sin, your spirits are alive because of righteousness. I think if anybody can really expound that verse to help me, I'd be very, very grateful. I've struggled with the commentaries. I think, I think, that's all I say, I think it maybe means that our, our bodies, we're still here in this world, and our, our bodies are still subject to death. We're going to die sometime. But then you see, the Christian has a different attitude to death from non-Christians. The Christian thinks in terms of the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. Death shadowing us and ours. But Jesus has conquered death. So we do not fear it. Our bodies are still subject to death, but because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we live and we die in the sure hope of the resurrection. Verse 12. So then, brethren and sisters, better be politically correct, so then, we are debtors we are under obligation to be true to what God has made us in Jesus Christ. We are under obligation to go along with God. Not to be like an unbeliever, grieving the Holy Spirit, resisting the Holy Spirit, quenching the Holy Spirit, because that whole way of life, says verse 13, that whole way of life will make your life and your personality wither and die. But if by the Holy Spirit you say no to every stirring within your human personality that would take you away from God. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And there's a sense in which a true believer will say, God, I, I, I don't understand all these, all that's said in these 13 verses of Romans, but I, I get the general drift of it. And if you're a believer, you will say, Now, God, go on, God. Go on, make a real job. Make me a real Christian. Go on, God. We'll sing about it in a moment in Wesley's world. Finish then thy new creation. Go on, God. Make a good job of me. And God says, no, you do it. And that is the life of faith. God has given us all that we need to do it. And that's why in another letter Paul says, now, work out the salvation that you have in Jesus Christ because it is God 